I'm so excited to be moderating this panel. Um, I'll briefly introduce um, each of the participants here. So over here, I'm joined by Evan Snyder, who's on the FDA's Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee. And he's the director of the program in stem cell and regenerative biology at the Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute. Um, over here, Deborah Spar, who is the president of Barnard College and the author of the book, The Baby Business, How Money, Science, and Politics Drive the Commerce of Conception. Um, and finally, we have Camille Hammond. Uh, she's the CEO of the Tanina Q. Cade Foundation. So thank you so much to all of you for being here. And um, uh, as I'm sure has been noted, this is meant to be a discussion, so please feel free to jump in whenever you'd like. Um, don't have to wait for me to call on you. So, Deborah, I'd actually like to start with you, because you make a point in your book that I think can help us frame this very big discussion. Um, you suggested that the highly personal nature of the reproductive and conception technology industry has had a huge impact on the way uh, businesses and governments behave. So. What I mean by that is it's hard for us to talk about fertility treatments in the same way that we would talk about hip replacements, for example. Um, and adding to that, there's this interpretation that some of these treatments and procedures are in some ways kind of putting a price tag on a child. So that makes it even more morally ambiguous. Um, so in that vein, you noted after your book came out that since no one likes to think of children as existing in a market, we've been very wary of discussing cost. So can you talk a little bit more about that dynamic um, and how it has influenced the evolu evolution of the industry? Sure. So thank you. And, and I'll just start with a very, very brief anecdote that, that I was relating uh, to Camille when we were, we were just chatting before. You know, people always ask me why I wrote this book. And the assumption is that there's a personal relationship to it which is funny because I wrote previous books on the internet and diamonds and nobody ever asked me if I had a personal <laughs> relationship to either of those. Um, but I think there is a presumption in this area that you're here for personal reasons, particularly if you're a woman of a certain age. Um, but, but I came to write this book for, for non-personal reasons. I had written my last book on the evolution of, of technology and I was looking around for the next technology that was about to evolve in an exciting way and I stumbled into this field. And at that time I was a professor at Harvard Business School and so I was used to talking to businesses who bragged about how much money they made. And then I went into the fertility industry. And not only did nobody brag about how much money they were making, people just completely disavowed the fact that money was having anything to do at all with their undertaking. And I, I, must, I found that fascinating. I thought, wow, this is the only business ever where people don't talk about money. And yet the sums of money that were changing hands were massive. And that was the impetus to write the book. And it was a, a sort of bizarre and provocative book to, to write, to talk about reproduction through the commercial lens, through the economic lens. But I actually came away th after doing all the research and writing the book thinking that not only was it a provocative lens, it was actually a very useful lens. Because I think, and I'm sure you all know this and have spoken about this, we get so queasy talking about reproduction, both because it just raises the, u the, the yuck factor. <laughs> Um, and also because it's so deeply personal. It's so incredibly intimate. And it raises so many deep um, ideological and philosophical issues, particularly in this country, that we're not really comfortable talking about it politically, so we don't. And my argument is not that, not that it's had any effect on, on policy in this area, but if I did have the magic wand to make it stick, I actually think we should have more regulation in this area. We should have more rules. And rather than trying to approach those rules philosophically or spiritually, which gets us all convoluted, we can actually use the lens of commerce, which does work pretty well um, with things like hip replacements. And I always use the analogy of cancer drugs, less personal, less intimate than baby making, but close. And so that's sort of my pitch for why this may not be the only lens to use, but certainly a lens that should be part of the way in which we view this world. And actually, uh, on this uh, regulation question, I want to turn to you now, Evan. Um, so we, of course, know that there's very little government regulation in this industry, and yet there are some places where government um, has played a role. So this past winter, you were part of a committee that looked into this um, new procedure known as mitochondrial transfer, which we heard about at an earlier panel. Um, but uh, you know, could you give us a quick overview of what the government is legally able to regulate right now and uh, what kind of power the FDA has. And then, you know, 
bridging off of that, what do you think the government's role should be in regulating um, some of the treatments in this market? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Now, having posed all of these questions, I, I should mention I'm probably here under false pretenses. I'm not really a government person. I'm not in regulation. I'm a scientist. I'm a physician. I'm a pediatrician, actually. And I run a lab in a, in a center. I was simply designated as the chairman of the FDA's Cell, uh, Tissue, and Gene Therapies Advisory Committee not because of my regulatory knowledge, which has grown a little bit, <laughs> but because I, I've been in the stem cell field and the gene therapy field and the regenerative medicine field for many, many years. So what I have learned is that my committee are really physicians and scientists who look at the data. And they simply, and we have no, um, no decision-making ability. What we do is we look at the data and we advise the FDA based on the data whether or not something is safe, whether it's effective, whether the data is there to make a decision one way or the other, and what more needs to be done to be able to make an intelligent decision. So we look at the data the way we would look at a grant application or a paper submitted to us and we go through it and, and we suggest to the FDA the position they should take. I should also say that the FDA, uh, at least in my field, which goes everywhere from academia to biotechnology, is unfairly demonized. They are seen as the obstacles to health care or, or the abettors of certain industries making money or not. And they're not. They are also physicians and scientists who have decided to take a regulatory path for their career as opposed. But they also will look at the data and make a recommendation. The higher bar is, the highest bar is for safety. And interestingly, for this session that we had in, uh, I guess it was actually last spring, we were instructed by the FDA not to take into consideration any ethical or public policy implications in this. We are solely tasked with looking at whether the science justified moving ahead in a clinical trial. And we looked at the data, and, and we simply came to the conclusion that the preclinical data was not quite there yet. In terms of safety and then efficacy, we outlined a number of experiments that needed to, to be done preclinically, meaning in animals, and that what a clinical trial would look like if and when it ever got to that point. So having said that, um, again, the FDA does have the ability to sanction or not sanction things. But it, it, it is not the same in this country as it is in the UK, for example, where this is absolutely, it, it's a big deal for them. And they took a great interest in our deliberations because there they really need to change law. Here, for whatever reason, and I, I think it's political and religious and, uh, and all kinds of other reasons, the government actually took a back seat in the field of uh, assisted reproduction. And it looked like it stood them in good stead. They just stood on the, st uh, on the sidelines until the advent of the stem cell field and, and now this. And now I think they... Well, it's hard to know. Do they regret not having been more involved, or, or are they actually in a good place? So a lot of the decisions will be not whether or not. So where the FDA will now play a role probably will be not even judging whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. They will make a, a, a judgment as to whether it is now safe to launch into a clinical trial for those patients that wish to undergo this procedure and for those physicians that feel that they want to do it. It'll be purely advisory. Sure. <clears throat> and to kind of clarify one point, one of the reasons that so many people have called for more regulation um, is because the cost of infertility treatments is just kind of astronomical. Um, and of course that high cost can be a major barrier to access. Um, in vitro fertilization, for an example, um, is 
I believe, the most common reproductive technology currently used as an infertility treatment. Um, and I read, according to the New York Times, the overall cost for one cycle using a woman's own eggs ranges from 14000 to 16000 which is a um, huge amount of money. So Camille, I want to turn to you because you started the Tanina Q. Cade Foundation um, to help needy families overcome infertility by providing financial support um, for domestic adoption and for um, infertility treatment. Um, so you also have an incredible story of overcoming infertility yourself. Um, in 2004, your 55-year-old mother, Dr. Tina Q. Cade, whom the um, organization is named, served as your gestational surrogate uh, and delivered her own triplet grandchildren. So that's kind of the most incredible story I've ever heard. Um, you're also, of course, a trained physician. So uh, what to you are the biggest problems surrounding regulation and access in the industry right now, and particularly um, if we look towards low-income communities? They won't have enough money, and so it's not even worth considering. And um, that creates a situation where only people who have money, the more affluent, um, have the opportunity to build their families. And I don't believe, and there are many that don't believe, that uh, being a parent is, or being a good parent, um, is determined by how much money you make. And so I think that if there are regulations that protect poor families' um, rights or their opportunities to pursue parenthood, regardless to whether it's through fertility treatment or adoption, um, that that should be pursued. And do you see um, any of the access problems being solved or exacerbated through um, kind of innovations or new technologies that are out there? I see that a lot of problems being solved through new technologies. Um, I was, uh, as we were sitting in the back chatting, just talking about um, the, the things that are possible now because of embryo freezing and egg freezing. Um, now, because there are large uh, banks of embryos that have, uh, the donors have already been screened, they've already gone through treatment, um, and they're, they're just there and available. First of all, the cost associated with um, becoming uh, the recipient of an, an embryo donation has gone down because instead of paying the cost of um, the donor costs and having one person or one family take on that entire expense, those fees are able to be split between two, sometimes three, sometimes four families. If the donor produces 20 or 25 eggs, instead of spending the $30,000, having one family spend that $30,000, it may be that three families spend $10,000. And that would make it possible for families that had less access to money to move forward and make use of that genetic material to build their families. So that's just one example of how the evolving technology has made family building um, an option for families that are less advantaged, and that's important. And Deborah, when you were writing your book, um, you know how much uh, I don't know how much re um, reporting you did into kind of the low-income community access issues, but um, how has that? How have you seen that evolve over the past? Well, I think you know it's still largely a bad news story that, due to the work of Camille and Kate, Kate Foundation and, uh, and and a few others, mm -hmm. is getting better. Um, but this is I don't mean to sound like I'm pitching here, but this is why I think an economic lens is helpful, because unless you talk about the money here, you never actually uncover the fact that we, this is an area that's particularly prone to inequities. I mean, we live in a country that's already not so great on the, the equality scale. But if, if you look at the fertility area, it's particularly bad. Infertility crosses all lines. Yes. You know, it's, it's not in any way centered on a particular race, particular ethnicity group. It, it seems to be one area where, where mother nature at least is fair, mm -hmm. um, for better and worse. But so given that, and, and I think it's an if, but if you believe that becoming a parent is either a human right or at least a good thing, then it seems fundamentally unfair that there's a group of people that should lose out twice. That number one, they're infertile, and B, they don't have access to the funds um, to, to, act, to, to uh, 
do something to correct their, their infertility. Mm -hmm. So I think, to Camille's point, I think technology will help. I don't think it will solve. Mm -hmm. I think what we need are, are uh, foundations such, such as, as hers. But also, it's a less sort of you know, sexy or obvious route to go. But insurance companies can actually Absolutely. be a very big player in this market. So I wrote this book when I was in Massachusetts. Massachusetts was one of the few first states to enfold or uh, wrap up in infertility coverage into standard insurance. And it didn't really do, you know, there was a little bit of a, you know, f uh, a hue and cry over it, but it didn't really do much. Um, it didn't affect the premiums of, of all Massachusetts citizens. It's very doable. And more states are starting to move in that direction. I believe that you will find that in states where there, there is um, insur an insurance mandate, particularly one where families have access to $100,000 and three attempts at IVF, they're more likely to be um, conservative in the treatment. The, the clinics are less likely to put in um, more than one embryo, which decreases the likelihood of having a multiple gestation pregnancy, which decreases the likelihood of both bad outcomes for the baby or babies and the mother. So we've seen that insurance does make a big difference when families don't have a lot of money. They are more likely to say, I've got five embryos. I want you to put all five back because I don't have enough to do this again and I don't have a thousand dollars to freeze those embryos so give me my best shot right now. And you wind up with octomom. Exactly. <laughs> well, she had other issues. Yeah. So, you know, as you guys mentioned, there are 15 states right now, I think, um, that have some kind of law on the books for um, infertility treatments um, and, and insurance coverage. But um, what, uh, where will policy change come from? I mean, is it going to be a state-by-state -state thing? Do we need some kind of overarching federal policy? Um, will change ever come? I mean, these are big questions, but um, where, you know, where do we need to kind of focus our efforts in the coming years? Is it, would it be more of a kind of state-by-state -state advocacy campaign or, or nationally? I, I think it will come. It'll have to come state by state because the, the country is too diverse. And, but it's interesting. I, I, I agree that, and I'm in Cal I was in, in Boston for many, many years, and now I'm in California that, um, that has state-funded uh, research in regenerative medicine and cell biology. The way that we ultimately got that passed was making an economic argument, not even a, a, a quality of life argument or, or uh, increasing knowledge argument. It was an economic argument. And the reality is that um, if an investment is made and making health care available to everybody, including better reproductive medicine, that ultimately will lower the health care costs of families and kids in particular throughout. And that will have an economic argument. And that, I think, is the way to make the argument, even in states that might seem less predisposed to want to do this. So. And I would agree. I mean, I th you know, I, I, I'm a little bit jealous of some of the European states. I think the UK actually does mm -hmm. quite a good job of, of having a central regulatory authority. Um, but given that our Congress seems sadly incapable of passing a budget. <laughs> um, I, you know, I just don't see this anywhere on the horizon. So I, I, I think the states quietly have done a pretty good job. You know, some better than others. California is a leader. Massachusetts, New York is slowly moving in that direction. So I think the state level is, is our best um, option. And insofar as people are lobbying for this, I think the state level is appropriate. I should also just say, though, I think you know, there's two issues that are preventing regulation. The first is the, the yuck factor um, and the abortion issue. You know, it's very hard to have any kind of policy without defining the, em the embryo, which n is not a good political strategy uh, for most elected officials. Um, but I think the other issue is there's not a natural constitu constituency to fight for regulation. The fertility clinics, like most practitioners, don't want regulation. Even though it might, in the long term, be good for the best practitioners, it's understandable. No industry wants, wants to be regulated. The families that go through this, at least in my experience, you know, while they're going through it, they're just focusing on the process. They're focusing on the science. They're not going to Washington. And once they're through it, they don't want to see themselves as infertile anymore. Mm -hmm. They want to be, if you will, normal again. And so unlike cancer survivors or AIDS, you know, th there hasn't been a political 
There hasn't been a natural political constituency. I think that um, state by state is how this has evolved in the past. It, it didn't start off in the 15 states. It started off with one and, and moved to the next. Um, so I think that that is how it's going to end up happening. Um, you brought up earlier the UK and kind of jealousy over the way that they do things. Um, what do you all think, you know, are there countries beyond the UK or perhaps it's just the UK that we can learn from? Um, are there any kind of transferable lessons? Um, and of course, you know, we always in the family policy arena look at Scandinavian countries as the, as, um, as kind of perfection. But um, where, where can we look to abroad um, for uh, lessons? It is Scandinavian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I haven't looked at this in a while, but last, last time I looked, so Denmark had a fabulous policy early on that they paid for three cycles uh, of IVF as long as the woman was below a certain age, mm -hmm. which was tough, but I think appropriate. They then um, evolved the policy to allow for same-sex couples. I think they were sort of the first country to, to embrace that. Um, Sweden, I don't know enough, I don't remember how they fund it. But they've been very vigilant in mandating the collection of data and long-term studies, which I think is crucial. We should be tracking the long-term effects on both you know, mothers, babies, and donors. Um, and so I think they're, they've always been, in my mind, particularly leaders. Israel's interesting. You know, on the good side, um, it's sort of eternal coverage. You can keep trying again and again and again. Um, as long as you're creating Jewish babies, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've heard, and this is totally anecdotal, but I've heard from a number of families that the fact that they will keep paying forever actually becomes an emotional burden on, on families. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Global question? No. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just Scandinavia, as always. All right. And the um, UK. The UK. And the UK. Very good. All right, great. Um, so, I, I can add one oh, thing, sure. though, that, uh, you know, I think the point that you're saying about follow-up of the, of the outcome is really, really important. And that, uh, that, uh, the fact that our in, uh, assisted reproduction was not regulated here meant that 20 to 30 years of outcomes were lost because, because there was no regulation, nobody was keeping track of things. So now when we come, like in my committee, to have to uh, assess is nuclear transfer a good, safe, effective thing for this class of diseases? Um, and, and I had to talk to the people at the UK. They said, well, a lot of what you're complaining about is no different than any woman going through assisted reproduction. Don't you guys know what the risks are and what the outcomes are? And I had to say, well, unfortunately, not really, not in any systematic fashion, but they do. Mm -hmm. um, and they were able to say, you know, these concerns that you had, our data indicate are not really something you need to worry about. You know, focus on this, but don't worry about that. And we really had no guidance. So some kind of follow-up is exceptionally important. Now, and I will say, I think that the UK does provide a lot of great leadership, but there are still challenges with that system. The wait is often up to two years. Um, and there are, are many restrictions, depending on the country. Um, and I. It, so a lot of women or families are now coming from there where they would get it for free and paying tens of thousands of dollars because when you want to build your family, you don't want to wait two years for the possibility of being able to move forward. You want to do it immediately because it does become an all-consuming focus. And um, so many of them are, are leaving that and coming here. So I think that they provide great leadership, a great model, but it's something that we can learn from and, and improve mm -hmm. if we're willing to make some dis uh, tough decisions. So I want to get back to something that you um, mentioned a little bit earlier, Deborah, which is kind of what's holding us back from moving forward in terms of regulation, but also just in terms of the evolution of our thought on some of these issues. Um, and it seems like we're kind of stymied by a few big unanswerable questions. And one is, is the ability to reproduce, should that be a basic right? And um, you know, should it also be part of medical care? So these are these kind of big monster questions. Um, so I want to get all of your thoughts on some of these questions. But also, what are the other big questions that still need answers if we are going to move forward um, in kind of the public debate? If you want to <laughs> All right, I'll start, start. So as I, th I think I have this line in the book, I, I, 
I don't know that, that I feel competent to say whether something is a human right or not. I mean, that's for the philosophers to think through. But I, I think most people would agree that becoming a parent is certainly one of the important things in life. You know, biologically, it is actually what we're programmed to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I think considering infertility as a medical issue is kind of a sensible approach. Although it does, it does um, ask, you know, it does impose some constraints. Um, you know, becoming a mother at 65 uh, or not being able to become a mother at 65 is not a medical condition. That's just tough luck. Um, <laughs> whereas becoming a father at 65 is not. So I think we have to, you know, follow the guidelines there. Um, and, and I think, you know, some of the, so that part to me is relatively easy. I think the questions we're facing now are, you know, fascinating and, and never ending in large part, and I'm sure you all, you know, study this here, our notion of the family is fundamentally changing. So a same-sex couple can't become parents in the old-fashioned way. They, by definition, will be infertile in their chosen relationship. So what do we do about that? How do we address that? Um, how do we deal with the, uh, the stunning increase in single mothers? You know, that way back when was un an unnatural state to imagine a single mother. It's now quite common. But should we, and a single mother again will have to use either technology or the bar, you know, to, mm -hmm. to become a parent. So, you know, how do, how do we think about that? So I think, and, you know, technology will always move faster than, than social norms, and both of them will move faster than, than the law. But how do we try to sort of at least keep the law and regulation in a country that doesn't like regulation, not from falling, not too far behind? what technology will allow and what society increasingly is embracing. And I'll just throw in one more thing here as someone. I, I had two kids the old fashioned way and then adopted my third. I don't want to lose sight of adoption here because this is one of the risks here. There, this is the public service piece. You know, there's still a lot of kids out there you know, who don't have families. And, and I think we need to keep sight of that so it doesn't all become about um, the technological solutions. Camille, any thoughts? I'm just going to kind of tail and dovetail off of what she said, but um, at least as far as adoption goes, I think that giving parents or giving families, however you define yourself as a family, the option of pursuing and becoming parents, whatever that means, whether it's through domestic adoption, international adoption, embryo adoption, fertility treatment using your own gametes, fertility treatment using donor womb, you know, the pathways to parenthood are varied and I would not begin to tell one person that their pathway is better um, than another. But I do think that people should have the right to choose and to pursue. And I do not feel that um, income should be a barrier to making that choice. So because this event is called the Future of Reproduction, I would be remiss if I didn't throw that in here. Um, I was struck by a, an Atlantic piece that was written by Alexis Madrigal um, this past June, and he writes that future reproductive innovations are likely to be led by practitioners with little U.S. government oversight. Few people, it seems, want to stand in the way of someone who desires a biological family. Um, so I'm curious to see if all of you think this is true, if this is likely to just kind of remain the same um, for the next few decades. And then I'll, I'll start with you. So rephrase the question again. Sure, Please. sure. So, so Alexis, after um, doing many interviews with doctors and um, reproductive health experts, uh, says that innovations are likely to be led by practitioners with little U.S. government oversight. So few people want to stand in the way of somebody that desires a biological family. Right. Uh, you know, I think that the science will get better. Um, the costs will come down. Coverage will get broader. Um, so that will change. But I, you know, I think, as was mentioned before, the desire to be a parent desire to be part of a family that that is uh, that's existed since uh, since the dawn of mankind i think uh, as a pediatrician my biggest concern is not the technology or the definition of the family or how the parents are are, are defined it's what is it's the well-being of the child yes yeah. and that that as a pediatrician that's my major focus if the child is healthy and happy then however that child came to be and in whatever environment that child is, is the right way to go. And, and I think we see that evolution. 
Um, every time there's a, there's a new technological breakthrough, particularly in this area, but, but in other areas as well, we get scared. Um, we dub it as unnatural, you know, ag against the will of whatever religious uh, authority people may believe in. And yet we get used to it pretty quickly. And I think so long as these technologies are, are capable of producing healthy children, you know, what, the, what you get at the end of the technology is just a baby. And we like babies. And I think, you know, cloning may take us there. This is way closer to your field than mine. Who knows? Mitochondrial transfer is going to make people very, very nervous until it starts becoming more common and then people will become less nervous. So I think it's, it's part of a fairly natural course. I should also say, getting to the baby is the easy part. It's, it's then raising, raising the, the kid <laughs> that's, <right. laughs> that's the really t that takes the real talent. Right. <laughs> yeah. I I hope that 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 quote is correct. Um, I I think that it should be driven by practitioners. Um, I have seen an increasing number of attempts on the legislative side of things to regulate family building that have given me cause for concern. Um, and so I think that it's unclear. I, I do think that policy is coming and I think that it can be a very important tool to make it possible for all families to pursue parenthood. Um, but I think it can also be very dangerous um, if, if people use different lenses, whether it's a faith lens, uh, whether it's a um, kind of a lens of race, ethnicity, or, and, and a belief. It, it, you, people can look at policy through different lenses, and I think that it can be very positive, but it can also be very destructive, and it can prevent people from moving forward. So on that note, um, I wanted to open it up to any questions we might have in the audience. So if mitochondrial replacement therapy that they talked about both on your panel and the first panel were to move forward. How do you see insurance coverage dealing with that in the sense that women are not truly infertile, but they're unable to have a healthy child? And Camille, how does a foundation like yours maybe look at an issue like that? Cade Foundation requires a diagnosis of infertility in order to um, have a family be, be able to move forward for funding. And we do get calls all the time from families that have had sick babies um, and, and with requests for help and while the information that we provide is open and available to everyone we are very limited we're a small uh, nonprofit and so we just we can't afford to fund everyone so you have to have a letter from your doctor that says that you have infertility um, in order to qualify for our grant Hi, Christine Scheller. I'm here from the American Association for the Foundation. I'm sorry, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, and I'm wondering about what you just said about regulation. It's my understanding that a lack of regulation can compromise um, health of of women in part because of um, the. I'm sorry, I just got so nervous. Uh, in part because of the um, ex extra amount of drugs and things that are given uh, to them for the hyperstimulation of their ovaries um, and also the exploitation of women for egg donation um, and that regulation would help those things. Can you tell me what kinds of regulation you're concerned about? Yes. So I think that um, the regulation would never supersede the physician's ability to practice medicine and the amount of drugs that women receive for fertility treatment for stimulation that's that's a physician choice that's not necessarily a regulation choice um, I think if you look to the example of the United Kingdom where um, you know families are have the opportunity to have a free cycle of, of uh, IVF, um, there is a lower incidence of multiple gestation because the government's paying for it and they're only allowing you to put one embryo back. So there, there is a lower, unless the baby, unless the embryo splits and becomes twins, um, th that's just the likelihood of a better 
maternal and fetal outcome is there because you're not putting in multiple embryos versus here if I'm a, a low-income family or a family that just can't afford to have IVF more than one time and we have five healthy good-looking embryos I may um, want my doctor I may per pressure my physician to put all five embryos back into my womb to increase the likelihood that I would get one baby out of it and um, you know the data would suggest that the likelihood of getting one baby is also the same likelihood of getting a multiple gestation birth so you don't you don't get kind of the you're, you're more likely to get pregnant it's just you're more likely to get pregnant with more babies but uh, wouldn't that suggest regulation because in, in Europe they yeah. actually regulate you have to do single embryo transfer so I agree that that is a good thing that there are a lot of um, bills being considered um, not just involving whether or not people should have the the right to have IVF or as is the case in Europe um, whether or not it's free or if it's paid for um, but also you talked about um, abortion and uh, the the status of the embryo as a person um, there are a number of personhood bills that have been introduced throughout the country that would have um, long-term effects on this if an embryo is um, considered a person and a family has five embryos and can't afford to freeze four what happens to those four remaining embryos now that they are people if you don't freeze them you kill them um, and so that may limit or actually in some case prevent families from being able to move forward because you know killing people is homicide you go to jail for that um, I think that there are a lot of issues that, that um, come into play when you look at some of the personhood um, laws that have been proposed. So I think that there's just a lot to consider. Um, but I do agree that um, some policy is a wonderful thing. And I think, as I said before, that the model that is in place in the United Kingdom um, is a great one and one that if we're able to perhaps tweak, um, can be uh, just wonderful for so many families. I, I should add that in this country, in lieu of governmental regulation, the professional societies are, do a great deal of policing of the physicians. And there are policies that are issued by, by ACOG, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and things of that sort, such that um, a physician who wants to be held in good standing among his peers really does adhere to what the guidelines are of this, per, uh, of this particular professional society. So for example, the, uh, the, the physician who allowed the octomom to give birth was sanctioned, not legally, it wasn't criminalized, but he was sanctioned by the professional, by the professional society that deals with assisted reproduction. Sometimes that can even flow over to losing your medical license in a state. So, you know, we could debate maybe, maybe that's even a more potent kind of uh, regulation than having it, you know, having it by, by statute in that it does preserve the, um, the clinical judgment that, that often has to exist. You, you know, you don't want a legislator trying to be your physician or your obstetrician. But there's a whole history and data that dictates what is or is not good practice. And if somebody deviates from that, if a physician deviates from that, he really is sanctioned. So it's not governmental, but it is his peers. Although it, it, it is a weaker sanction. It's a weaker sanction. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, there, there's probably some midpoint. There probably needs to be a little bit in certain really grievous areas. Uh, you've talked about um, issues with regulation in the United States and in Europe, and I'm curious about, uh, do you think that this technology is ever going to reach a point where it extends to parts of the world where uh, uh, reproductive practice is, say, at the midwifery level. Is it ever going to happen that this becomes a kind of biohacking that would, uh, uh, for example, in vitro fertilization become available in uh, areas where there's not the kind of high-tech assistive reproduction that's available here? Well, 
Some of it's happening already, I mean, in, in sort of fragments. So India has become quite a large market for surrogacy. Mm -hmm. So um, you know the, the you know that's that's fairly high tech, but but you know less high tech over time. Uh, China, and China's clearly not a you know a, a developing country, um, but China are very big users of all of these technologies, and in some ways for the because they have different constraints around stem cell technologies, um, doing a lot of things that in fact you can't do in this country. Uh, Singapore has created a whole sort of business hub. Um, around a lot of these technologies. South Africa is another big market for surrogacy. So again, those are all relatively developed countries, um, but, but, but it's out there. I have to say my, my concern about um, the high cost of high-tech medical interventions goes beyond just assisted reproduction. There are so many things that we do in, in, in the States or in, or in the Western world that we don't even think, we don't even bat an eyelash that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars that would be unthinkable in the third world. And I, I reflect on this very, very, I'm a neonatologist, that's one of my specialty. And I know that we will spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep a 24-weeker alive, whereas this is not, not, not even a discussion that can be had in the third world. And so there's, and I often feel that this is really unfair. Um, so it's, it, this kind of disparity as to what patients can expect um, goes beyond just assisted reproduction. It's every area of our, of our high-tech medical um, you know, enterprise right now. Questions up front, I think. I'm Roger Gilkison. Um, I just have heard about, um, and it touches on the commerce issue with the wealthy person who wants a baby and goes through a book, picks, uh, you know, the sperm donor and the egg donor who plays the violin and he wants that kind of person and then gets someone to, to get a surrogate for him. Then the baby is defective and legal stuff happens, and I've heard that it did happen in, in California, and the first thing was that the baby was an orphan, uh, but then it got changed. But I, I wondered about legal aspects of some of this. Well, it, I think the good news is that those stories are rare. Mm -hmm. yes. The bad news is that ha they happen. You know, and, and when they happen, they don't happen in the abstract. It's the life of a child. And so this is, I think this sits at the core of my concern. You know, I wish we did have more of a legal structure around the process so that at least in that case, and this varies a lot by, from state to state, there's some kind of an underlying legal contract that the surrogate has signed which has made provisions for what's going to happen if the child has, I mean, defective is a complicated word to use, but, um, but, but the, you know, that's where the gray area causes problems. Uh, J.D. Hansen. Uh, I work at the uh, Center for, for Food Safety and its uh, sister organization have been particularly looking at some of the genetic engineering of, of animals and cloning of animals, and uh, which is why you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear uh, that your committee is recommending more animal studies. Uh, I think the 12 that the Oregon folks have is a sm pretty small sample for, uh, in, for the mitochondrial nuclear transfer uh, experiments. I'd like to see multi-generations. Uh, th uh, that's not my, my question, though. Uh, you know, if we don't have regulations, what we end up in our country with is, is tort law. And, uh, you know, tort law actually works r relatively well for things. I have two sisters-in-law who have had failed hip replacements, and that's a product actually approved by the FDA. Uh, uh, even getting a $250,000 settlement from Johnson doesn't make up for the suffering you go through. Uh, but when we're talking about uh, experiments that are really gene transfer experiments, uh, like the uh, nuclear uh, transfer. Uh, uh, it's one thing if you have a hip that fails within five years, 
It's another thing if you change a gene that doesn't express uh, until later in life. Uh, uh, tort law doesn't work very well for that. I think that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> Well, certainly, and, and that was one of, the, one of the recommendations of our committee for this particular intervention. But if you're, you know, I, I interpreted your question as, as being broader than just something that has the potential of changing the germline, but any kind of uh, manipulation of the cellular or genetic component of a, of a patient in their somatic cells, not just their germline. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this, in the field of regenerative medicine, we wrestle with this all the time. Um, some of the initial studies, either with gene therapy or cell replacement, initially are in tissues that are very accessible. So the eye, because if something goes wrong, you, you know, you enucleate or you s do something like that. But there's a, a big clamor, and rightfully so, to deal with brain diseases and heart diseases. And right now, we do routinely bone marrow transplantation where, talk about three, you know, a, a person who's composed of three parents, anybody who's gotten a bone marrow transplantation is completely chimeric and every organ that's perfused by blood, which is everything, by another donor. Um, and you, you, it's hard to get rid of. Um, so it, 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 the, the lesson is you just need really, really careful preclinical studies and, e and, and stage clinical studies where you do an intervention, you stay back, and you wait long enough to see whether something bad is happening. So we just have time for one more question. Anyone back? So uh, going back to the commerce mm -hmm. question, um, I'm interested in how that lens, what that lens helps you see when you look at the way that egg retrieval is done in this country, because the young women who are being recruited to provide eggs for other people's fertility treatments or for uh, stem cell and other research for that matter, um, they're being uh, offered money to, to do this, to undergo this process, and their relationship to the doctor that's administering, that's conducting the procedure, is a little bit different than, the, than other people who are involved in fertility treatment, for example. They're not the patient of that doctor, although the doctor does ha supposedly have that duty, a medical duty to them, but they're not the paying client. And um, so I wonder how you see that, and also how does commerce play into this push, very aggressive marketing push now for women to freeze their eggs? So I think these are some of the most interesting questions, at least in my mind. I mean, first of all, the language is just funny. We call it egg donation, and we pay lots of money for it. So right away, you can, see, you can sense this unease with acknowledging that this is a commercial transaction. The second thing that in my mind is totally screwed up, although getting a little bit better, is that in this country, we will allow a young woman to be paid kind of anything to, quote, donate her eggs for reproductive purposes, but in most states, she cannot be paid literally even bus fare if she donates exactly those same eggs through exactly the same procedure for stem cell science. And so I think there's a fundamental and really inexplicable lack of symmetry there. Um, if I had the magic wand, which I don't, I would say let's focus on the medical issues first. Is it safe for women to be, to be producing eggs in this manner? Are we overstimulating? Are there certain women who shouldn't be allowed to go through this procedure? We should regulate, in my ideal world, the information that these women are receiving, and we probably should limit the number of times they can do the procedure until we have much better long-term studies about what, what the long-term effects might be on their offspring. Once we put those standards in place, I don't actually care how much they're paid. I think, as in other areas where, where women are selling body parts, we actually focus too much on the price and not enough on the underlying issue. So I think this area is sort of a mess. Egg freezing, you know, evolving, and, and we were talking, you know, in my role as a college president, I do feel I have a public service commitment to tell young women, don't see this as the magic cure-all. You know, 
it may be an insurance policy, but it doesn't give you the ability to control your life in this neat and packaged way that I see many young women now grabbing onto. You know, they believe that if they freeze their eggs, get their career, you know, make partner, then they will magically find the right partner, unfreeze the eggs, and produce the babies at 42. You know, it doesn't always work that neatly. So I think we need to be very clear at understanding what these practices are. They're very, very, very clever marketing operations. Um, for very interesting technology, but it's not a cure-all for you know how to how to lead the perfect life. Well, on that note, um, we unfortunately <laughs> have to end. <laughs> but very interesting food for thought. So thanks so much yeah, to all of you. <laughs>